Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sadr Modiri from BKG, a federal agency for cartography and geodesy in Germany, and I'm connecting uh, to this meeting from Frankfurt on behalf of my colleague Justina from CBK uh, Poland and Santiago Belda from University of Alicante. I welcome um, all of you uh, to our first EOP INI I I scientific meeting organized by, um, by our study group AI for EOP prediction at GIGOS. And um, when I also look at the list, uh, it was, I can see uh, many researchers and scientists here to have uh, to attend this EOP uh, related topic meeting. And um, I'm also very excited to have you all here to explore. Uh, how machine learning can help us in our work. Um, our agenda today includes a, a welcome and introduction uh, by chairs and follow by our invited speaker uh, presentation and a time for question and uh, of course discussion and as this uh, part will include general information and serve as an introduction to AI and its application in our uh, space geodetic related uh, research topic. We openly invite it, all researchers uh, who are interested in AI and its application to attend our meeting. And we also uh, plan to announce our meeting through the uh, GIGOS website and its relevant social network, uh, which we already also done for this meeting. And uh, if you uh, check the GIGOS website, uh, you can see and see the uh, advertisement for this meeting. And the second part of our meeting will be more technical and focus on organizing our study group. Uh, we will talk about uh, how can we work together with IERS, EOP, PCC uh, working group, and we might also discuss uh, the potential research area for our study group and have open discussion uh, to uh, for all member. And what I could say in general, um, EOP innovation and site meeting aim to connect artificial intelligence with geodesy, especially focusing on EOP prediction. And we want to provide a simple or easy introduction to machine learning and deep learning technique focused by practical example relevant to our work and this help us and also our members uh, to understand different machine learning method and how uh, they can be used in the uh, data analysis and data processes and for our case for uh, data prediction. And our main goal is to create a space where we can all learn and innovate together and we expect uh, that through this meeting we can improve our understanding and skill in EOP relevance topics uh, with use, uh, by using artificial intelligence. And I think from my side, I try to cover um, the information about EOP, INI uh, meeting, and I might also ask um, Justina, if you have something to add, uh, you can also go ahead. You're mute, uh, Justina. Sorry, so uh, thank you, Sadek, for a nice introduction. And at the moment, I have nothing to add, so you can proceed. Yeah, and I think um, Santiago is 
uh, not yet in the meeting. Uh, therefore, I um, do not want to uh, continue uh, the introduction part and welcoming part, and I will go uh, for the invited speaker today. And um, I should also mention uh, today we are honored to have uh, Jun Yang Zhu from Institute of Geodesy and Photogrammetry from ETH uh, Zurich, uh, Switzerland as our invited speaker. He will talk about uh, recurrent neural network and their application for EOP prediction. What I learned from his CV, I think I can also point it out here just to um, introduce him um, uh, for those who uh, doesn't know him. Uh, Jun Yangju has a bachelor of science in geodesy and geoinformatics from Wuhan University. Then he moved to Germany and obtained another degree from University of Stuttgart, uh, where also I did my master there. <laughs> Afterward, uh, he moved to ETH Zurich, uh, where he earned um, uh, his master in geomatic. And since 2022, I think he had been uh, started uh, his PhD. And what is also uh, was interesting, he um, till now uh, he uh, had published some paper uh, relevant to AI and machine learning and its application. And we believe that his presentation will give us valuable insight into how advanced machine learning technique can help us predict EOP. Uh, Jun Yang, the stage is yours, and um, if you can first introduce yourself and confirm the information that I already gave, and then uh, you can also share your uh, screen and we are listening to you. And after this part, it will be um, time for discussion and and also a question. And after that, we will start the organization part. Yeah. Ah, great. Thanks for the, this introduction. Uh, can you hear me well? If, I'm not yes, sure. from my oh, side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I just confirmed the information are correct. So I do not really have to repeat all of them by myself again. And thanks a lot. And uh, let me maybe share my screen. I think you should see the slides. So, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jun Yao from the Space Geodesy Group at ETH Zurich, and I'm currently a PhD student. So, actually, it's also uh, my great honor to be invited to be here and have this opportunity to share and discuss my uh, experiences and opinions about applying deep learning or artificial intelligence in EOP predictions. So hopefully today we'll have a very great discussion and uh, I will also learn a lot from you, I'm sure. Then I will first start with a very basic introduction to deep learning to some of the audience maybe who are very familiar with EOP already, but maybe not so familiar with deep learning yet. Uh, hopefully those part of the information will not be too boring for some of you who are already a deep learning experts. So I took a lot of information from this famous book uh, written by a uh, good fellow uh, in 2016. So I really suggest if you are interested in that, you can have a look here. So first I wanna say, what is machine learning? What is deep learning and what is artificial intelligence? So actually there is not such a clear definition, but I just share my own opinion. So first of the artificial intelligence is really a broad definition and uh, which we generally mean is like we want to let machines do what human can do or what human can even cannot do. For example, I give two very famous examples here, the AlphaGo, who really beat the world champions in the Go games. 
And also, everyone maybe already know that the ChatGPT, which is the most famous large language model for now, like which was released, I think, one and a half year, years ago. And uh, pretty much everyone who works on deep learning will also get some information from this two years now. So those are some of the very um, successful examples of the artificial intelligence in general. But when we narrow it down, just want to have a look into the algorithms behind it. Usually we call them machine learning. And what, what does machine learning mean? You, uh, we can say, okay, we want to let the model learn from a given set of data without being explicitly programmed, which means, okay, we know that we have some input data and we have some targets. We believe that there exists a very good relationship between them, but unfortunately, we do not know them in details. We cannot write, write a very close form solution or maybe a physical equation based on that, but then we just uh, feed those data into the machine learning model and let the model to learn based on that. And I want to also mention one thing, like at the beginning of this century, actually the machine learning was the classical machine learning, like the support vector machine or random forest were very famous. And also at that time, People usually do one step called feature engineering. Like people do not directly fit the raw data into the model, but first they do some very heavily uh, pre-processing steps to generate some interesting features from the raw data. But for now, I mean, random forest and XGBoost, those kind of algorithms are still very powerful, but actually people can fit more like the raw data into them. So it, uh, the situation also changed a little bit. Then we come to the deep learning. So what does the deep learning mean? If you really want to give a very specific definition, to my understanding, I would say, okay, deep learning means neural network based models. So those concepts was actually introduced already in last century and actually even earlier than some of the classical machine learning algorithms. But unfortunately, it was not so successful at that time because we didn't have the enough computational resources. And in recent years, we know like the very rapid uh, development in the um, hardware uh, community also now, what we have, uh, our current PC is now much more powerful than before. So it's really enable us to re, how to say, re pick up this, this uh, concept and really apply them to some real tasks that we face today. So how about deep learning in earth science? I borrowed two figures from a very famous perspective paper published by Einstein in, at all in 2019. So we have a lot of data, different data sources from the earth system. And at the same time, uh, we actually have a lot of similar tasks as defined in the machine learning community. For example, uh, just to pick up the things that are quite uh, quite important for us, like we want to detect some some object in the machine learning community, which is the same if you look into the, for example, ionosphere or uh, earth uh, surface temperature, we want to detect some extreme patterns there. Or we want to improve the images, the, the resolution of the images of some RGB or depth maps from the computer, uh, computer vision community. And the same concept actually we can borrow and apply to the Earth observation data. We usually call them downscaling. And the next two, or maybe video is still not so relevant, but the language translation, or let's say the time series predictions might be the most important for, for today's talk, because when we're talking about EOP predictions, we are always deal with the time series data and we wanna do the predictions temporally. So therefore we can actually borrow some concepts from them and apply those to our problems. So I wanna start with a very, very basic introduction of the deep learning general concept, which means, okay, it's actually just an end-to-end data-driven method. We have a model. Basically we wanna predict a, a Y given the input X and some parameter theta. Whereas those trainable parameter theta include usually weights and bias and maybe also some other uh, things, which 
are directly learned from the given training data set. One very simple example here is the multi-layer perception, or sometimes it's called like fully connect neural network or fit forward neural networks. Um, they are rather the same. It's just a simple, I mean, it's not real simple, but just a connect to each other. So in this term, it's very simple combination of very real simple linear transformations followed by the simple activation functions. So with such a three simples in the end, we can actually approximate a very complicated continuous functions because we have the universal approximation theorem here. Um, but I just want to highlight like the first simple is not real simple, although like the connection between the two neighboring uh, neurons are really simple, but when we really look into the whole uh, model, like we have a billions of parameters and we cannot really understand this in detail. So this is called the black box nature of a deep learning model, which is also a very interesting task for us to investigate in the terms of explainable artificial intelligence, but it may be out of the scope of uh, our today's discussion. Uh, then, so we want to learn basically the weights and maybe also hear the bias here from uh, just a given set of data. Then we have also an another assumption is like we have the training data set which is already good enough to cover the whole data distribution. So we assume that the test data set, when we do the inference, they should in the same data distribution as our training data set. Otherwise, we face another problem called out of distribution or distribution shift, which will also cause some degradation in the performance of the deep learning. So then such a model, how can we really learn the parameters? So basically, we always optimize the model based on some gradient descent back propagation approaches, which means we have a set of inputs. We fit it into, into the deep learning model and we can get some predictions. Then we can compare those predictions with some of the labels to formulate some of the uh, log functions. For example, in our UOP predictions, those loss, loss functions usually be MAE or MSE. So we really learn the difference between our current predictions and the ground truth. Based on this differ, uh, difference, we compute the derivatives with respect to all the parameters and do the back propagation, try to minimize the loss function in the end in a way like in the feature landscape, we wanna find the local optimum in the end, which is our solution. Then, in my personal opinion, another very important task for us if we wanna apply the deep learning concepts into the geodetic problems, the key is to find the proper translations between these two problems. Like in deep learning, we know, okay, we have a lot of model architectures. We have different types of tasks, for example, regression, if we want to predict some numerical values or classification, if you just want to give a class or probability in the end. And uh, if we have the ground truth, we can learn the model in terms of supervised learning, or if we do not have, we do it in the self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. So really have a lot of concepts in, in the deep learning community. How to pick the most suitable tool for us to really solve our geodetic problems properly? I think it's very important. So let's have a look at the UOP prediction or the UOP data. Um, for us here, it's actually quite trivial and straightforward, like all the UOPs are time series. So, and actually we already have the ground truth based on the previous observations. So therefore, we can start with some like simple combinations like here, we choose a model architecture called recurrent neural networks, which I will introduce in the next maybe 10 minutes in details. These are really designed for the time series data. Since we already have the ground truth and we really want to predict the numerical values, we will have the type of optimization. Uh, we will have the supervised learning tasks, which means, as I introduced before, we can formulate the loss function and do the back propagation to optimize the parameters. So there are also some other tricks or the test specific concepts. Maybe uh, we do not need them for now, but we just keep them in mind. Okay. Uh, 
First, I want to introduce recurrent neural networks. What is recurrent neural, neural networks? So it's like in addition to the relationship between just some input features X and the outputs O or Y before I showed it, it also considers the relationship between the neighboring epochs. So if you look into the equation of, for example, just a hidden state of our and normal multi-layer perception neural, the hidden state is equal to like we have a set of parameters and just a given a one-dimensional feature vector, then we can get, give a prediction in the hidden state. But it becomes a little bit different for the RN neuron. We actually uh, do not only give the input features of our current epoch T, but we also give the hidden state of the previous epoch. For example, here, if you look into this, this figure, we always have the new input features of the current epoch, but at the same time, it also gets information from the previous epochs, which already been fit, fit into the neural network. So based on these two information, it will generate the new output of this current epoch, which means the output of the epoch T already has the sense of the previous information. So a very important difference here when you do the implementation in PyTorch or TensorFlow that pipelines, it's like the training data set now you has one more dimensions. Before you have the batch size and also the number of features, but now you also have the sequence length. So we have to be careful about it. Then it looks quite nice, right? And we always have the same parameters through time. But then we face actually one problem, which caused the challenge of the long-term dependencies. So if you just look at one hidden state of the time epoch T, it's equal to some weights multiplied by the previous hidden epoch. But also, we, we also include the, the current input features, but we just uh, ignore it in this equation for now. And which means if we move it back to the first, uh, first hidden, hidden states, we actually multiply the same weights multiple times, actually t times, it de depends on how long your sequence is. So if we do a, a eigen decomposition and write it in this way, where this capital lambda is the uh, eigenvalues, it's actually those eigenvalues are rest to the power of t, which means if those eigenvalues are not close to one, it will become very big or very small just after a long sequence, which is known as the gradient vanish issue or gradient explode issue. So it's just very hard to train and to get really the good relationship from the current epoch to, for example, 20 epochs ago. So we have to solve this issue. And the second issue is the current architecture is actually suitable for sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling, but there is a problem if you directly apply them to the predictions. So just imagine that the input sequence are the EOP from today and the, the last maybe 20 days, and we want to predict the next 10, uh, 20 days here. So the sequence-to-sequence -sequence modeling, which means the first output actually doesn't have any uh, that is the information of the later input sequence, which is not the thing that we want. We want to actually predict the next 10 days or 20 days based on all the previous information. And we actually know that the last epoch, basically today, should have the biggest impact for the uh, predictions because it's just uh, closer to, the, uh, uh, to our target. So those are the two problems. Let's solve them one by one. To solve the first problems, I want to introduce the long short term memory net networks or LSTM, which is one of the most famous uh, RNN neurons. So here I borrow a lot of figures and equations from the Collis blog uh, called Understanding RSTM Networks. So I also suggest you to go through the original blog if you are interested in that. Okay, let's have a look at the updated equations of a uh, normal RN neural again. So it's still quite simple. Like we just, uh, in addition to the input features, sorry, here should 
uh, here should be t, not t minus one. Uh, in addition to the input features, we also consider the hidden state, and that's all. And if you look into the uh, diagram, we just have one activation uh, function here. So it still looks okay, but if we move to RSTM, it becomes quite complicated. But don't worry, I will introduce them step by step in the next slides, and hopefully it will be clear for you. But the key idea is we want to generate a path, whereas the width may change at each time step. So we want to have a path through the whole time sequence. And uh, here we want to avoid the problem called uh, gradient descent, uh, gradient vanish or gradient explode. So, and one very important information here is like the sigma always uh, indicate the sigma e the activation function who has an output range from zero to one. And in the classical RSTM architecture, all the outputs from the sigma e activation function will serve as weights. You, know, you will uh, you will have a look in the uh, uh, in the, in the next slides. And the 10H always have the output range from minus one to one. And the output from this activation function serves as information, like then later we combine all those information together to generate the predictions. Okay, first, let's talk about the forget gate. So it means like we wanna know how much information from the previous epochs so we wanna keep them or we wanna forget them. So here, we just uh, look into this equation and this part of the neural. It's like we, again, get the same input as the an, normal RNN features and the previous hidden state and fade them into a sigmoid. The output would be zero and one, and if it's close to zero, we will then later multiply those values with the previous cell state, which means we wanna fully discard all the information that we got from the previous, previous epochs. And uh, those we have the trainable parameters uh, with some bias, which are different to the, uh, the, the, the other gates. Okay, the second one are the input gates. We take the same uh, inputs as the forget gate, but we have the different trainable parameters here. So therefore, considering the previous equation where we faced the problem, actually here, we have multiple different ways through the time. So therefore, we can avoid uh, the exponential rates of the, the eigenvalues, so to say. Here, we will actually generate two information. The first is the CTOT. Basically, it's how much information we want to update to the cell state, which go through the whole time sequence. And here, we fit those linear combinations to the tangent h and to get the output from minus one to one. And at the same time, we generate another uh, values from the input case, uh, which is zero to one. It's just to show, okay, how much information we can learn from the new epochs. Then we can update the cell states based on the new information, and we know how much information we should re uh, keep or discard from the previous hidden states. Sorry, sorry, cell states. Then we just combine them in this way. Forget gate, multiply by the uh, previous uh, cell states and plus the new information that we get from the current epochs. Then it will serve as the new cell state, which to the next time step. Then also with the output, and also the, uh, the the cell state of the current epochs, we can generate the hidden state, which we also propagate to the next layer, but also the next time epoch of the same layer of your uh, neural network. So basically, this, those are the full pictures of uh, RSTM, and I just briefly introduced, okay, because of the, the four gates and with the different trainable parameters, we can learn the long-term dependency to a certain degree. Then we try to solve the other problem, like the architecture of RNN. So previously we mentioned that, okay, 
the problem is like our output sequence only sends uh, oh, do, do not sense the full input sequence. So therefore, we want to introduce some different connections to solve this problem. So one, one op op option would be bi-directional. We want to first fit through the T1 to Tn, but at the same time, we also comes back. In this case, the full output sequence will have the sense for the full input sequence. But there is a very clear limitation of this approach is like we have much more trainable parameters then it will be more costly to train and it's actually hard, harder to, to optimize. The second option would be the called sequence to one architecture, which means, okay, we fit the whole inputs to a time series, uh, sorry, to, the, to an RSTM neural network, but then we just pick the output of the final epochs. So here, basically this final epochs really summarize the whole input sequence. And then we connect them with some fully connecting neural networks to project it to the, the lens of our, our targets. For example, we project to 10 days in the future. Here, one limitation is the output in the final fully connected neural network, we cannot really consider the relationship between the different epochs of the output sequence. Then we come to the third architecture called encoder decoder RSTM or RNN. Like the, it's quite similar to the sequence to one architecture first. We summarize the full input sequence and get the final hidden state. So this is just a one, one dimension vector, which later we call it context vector. And then we repeat it multiple times to the uh, with the same length of our target sequence. And then we fit the new sequence to our new RSTM. This part called decoder. Then in that case, the network also has the ability to consider the relationship between uh, the different outputs. But here, one limitation is we really need a quite high dimension in the context vector. Otherwise, it's not feasible to really summarize the whole uh, input sequence information. But all of them might be suitable for uh, different tasks. Okay, uh, with all those basic introductions, I want to move to our specific application example. And here we will focus on LOD prediction. And this work we uh, published, I think it's already like one year ago uh, in Journal of JLZ. So here the data is. Actually, the ROD data from IERS is available since 1973, but the orange lines here shows the arrows. The arrows before around 1985 are quite high. So therefore, we only choose the data from 1985 onwards. And another problem here is the time series is quite non-stationary with an Quite some of the information or signals that we can already go, uh, we can model them quite well. So we want to do some pre processing here. <clears throat> um, here I, I show the basic data pre processing steps on diagon, uh, di or diagram of, of this study. So we first have the full signals from LOD and we first remove the known title correction based on the IERS convention 2010. And uh, there is a type part, which we can later directly predict them in the future because they are really the deterministic part. And uh, then, based on the residues, we apply another smoothing called Gaussian, uh, sorry, called Savisky Gaulle filter, which is a data driven filter and just uh, can learn some interannual signals or decadal signals, not only the, the linear trends, because linear trend is. A little bit too simple to describe the ROD variability. After that, we ap apply another least square adjustment to just uh, remove the seasonal signals. And this, this part we can also simply extrapolate in the future. Then fit really the residual signals into the RSTM networks and let the model to predict this part. And at this stage, we also consider the EAM information because we know there are a very strong uh, geophysical relationship between them. 
So here is shows the original time series and also all the time series after the um, pre-processing. I just wanna highlight the S3 filter here. Like up when, once we apply this S3 filter, we re really have this kind of decadal change rather than a simple linear change. In that case, we can make the seasonal fitting in the end quite stationary. So we do not have to extrapolate any linear change in this case, which should be beneficial. And to the end, we fit this residual time series into our networks. Let me briefly introduce the architectures. So in that study, we actually tested four different model architectures. And uh, I actually didn't introduce all of them in the previous talk, uh, but uh, I just wanna highlight the encoder decoder RSTM in our study had the best performance in the end. And actually it's just a, with a very considerably smaller number of parameters. I think the number of parameters is just around 2,000 or 3,000. So they are really trainable based on just a limited number of EOP data. So here, as we as I introduced before, like I first take the whole input sequence fit into RSTM neural network and take the final state repeated multiple times to generate a new time series. And after the final RSTM of the decoder, we fit all those hidden states into the time distributed fully connected neural networks, which means we have a new uh, fully connected neural networks from this epoch to the same epoch. So in the FC1 and FC2, these two layers, we do not consider the sequential information anymore because those information should already be considered in the two previous RSTM layers. So in that study, we performed three experiments. The first one, we fully follow the first EOPPCC rules to just have a rather fair comparison with the previous studies. And the second experiments, we used more training data and uh, we also consider the two day delay in the operational use case because later when we participate into the second EOPPCC, we realize that, okay, the ROD are not really updated uh, so timely. There are, are actually a latency of two days. The third experiment, we discussed the most optimal uh, optimistic case, like if you do not have this kind of delay, like which accuracy can be achieved, but uh, I may not talk talk about it in, in today's talk. So the input features, I want to highlight that the EAM information are really valuable and beneficial for our predictions in the end, and we actually benefit from the EAM analysis data provided by GFC and also their six days forecast data. And later in our group, uh, we also provide the EAM prediction data to the two weeks in the future, developed by my colleagues Mustafa actually. Uh, then, but we realize that uh, accuracy at the later stage are actually really not, uh, I mean, not sufficient to provide some benefits. So therefore, we really cut by ten days. And also here, we only target on the ten days prediction in the future. So therefore. The feature dimension is either eight if it takes the six days forecast data provided by GFC or twelve if it takes the ten days uh, from the uh, from from ETH, and we consider the past of thirty days. So our sequence length is thirty. So here I want to show one result. Um, basically, the experiment one versus uh, VS experiment two. So here we wanna actually demonstrate the benefit of more training data for deep learning methods. Uh, first, I wanna say like we've seen the experiment one, a really limited number of training data. Our model already performs considerably or let's say reasonably good. So it's outperformed quite some of the first UOP PCC studies and also provide a very good predictions at the first days. But actually here we really train 12 individual networks for the 12 Based predictions. So um, the generalizability of the model was not so good because we didn't have enough data to really cover the whole data distribution, I think. But once we move to uh, back to 1985, 
we cannot have enough data. So now we just have one network and generate the predictions of the next 10 days. Or oh, here is actually five days, then we come back to. So here you can see based on the long term, uh, sorry, the 10 days EAM predictions, our predictions are quite accurate and uh, uh, stays, I think, under 0 0.9 milliseconds for the 10 days predictions. And uh, the benefit from the just, uh, let's say, longer and uh, a little bit more accurate EM predictions can also be demonstrated from these plots. But we, I also want to show this figure, like which shows the absolute error of individual days. You can see the biggest improvements at the later stage is like we reduce kind of the outliers in our predictions. Actually, we we already know that uh, our EM predictions on day 10, for example, was already not so accurate, definitely not under 0 0.1 millis millisecond level. But st still, they are helpful for us to generate the predictions with a better accuracy. This indicates that, okay, those EAM predictions are not so accurate, but they are still very valuable to point on the direction like where your LOD predictions should be or should go. So, so I think this is one of the explanation why um, those informations are really helpful for generate the predictions, uh, ten days prediction. Another another step we we try to analyze the feature importance and uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, like after a huge amount of such a simple connections of the neurons and our deep learning model comes to a very black box we cannot really understand what do the waste mean and what what happens inside so we we we, we try to have a look into that in a little bit we by doing it in the case like we per perturbing our inputs by randomly adding or removing values equal to around 30 percent of their magnitude which means uh, we want to an analyze the impact of inaccurate input features. So if one of the input features are really inaccurate, and then it re uh, results in a very huge change in the final prediction accuracy, we can see that, okay, this feature is quite important for our current model. So the result has shown in the uh, right-hand side. And uh, we can get some some information from here. Like first, ROD itself is the most important feature, which is quite reasonable because we want to predict ROD. So ROD contains the most straightforward and most valuable information. And at the same time, the EAM or AM predictions of day one actually have quite long impact in the future, even after maybe seven days. This is quite interesting because like those are the one day predictions and so those are the analysis data. So it's very important for our model to know a little bit like which directions of the ROD variabilities will change in the next few days. Uh, just next one day and the model will generate this one day's information to really seven days in the future. And generally EM have a stronger impact than if we just consider AEM, although we know that AEM has a major impact on ROD, but actually the the other angular momentum generated by hydrology, for example, hydrology or ocean, also have a quite uh, uh, quite important impact here. <clears throat> Another interesting thing here we can see is are the temporal patterns. For example, if we look at the diagonal. Which means okay, the AM information like or EM information of the day day five have a quite big impact on the LOD prediction on day five, which is quite reasonable because they have the relationship there. But we can also see that the predictions of day five also have some impact of the LOD of the previous days. This is not so logical for us, right? Because I mean the today's Earth rotation should not be impacted by any of the atmospheric changes in the future. So here it's for one another uh, information like deep, deep learning algorithms actually benefit from the correlation rather than the causation. So 
although we, we really consider them in the time series equation, but still, we still have some information from the future can come back to benefit the predictions of today. This is also quite valuable. And also, when we really interpret the result, we have to be careful. We cannot argue that, okay, it's because of the atmospheric change in 10 days later, it's today's Earth's, Earth's rotation has been changed. So it's, it's not reasonable at all. And uh, I also borrow one result from the uh, papers summarized the second UPPCC result. And uh, here we also have a machine learning groups here. And one general conclusion from the paper is like machine learning and the uh, least square plus autoregression models are the best performing methods. And at the same time, we really have to consider EO, EEM information, which are very beneficial for us to improve the prediction accuracy. So I marked 124 and 142 here. Those are two IDs that used EDRSTM and submitted by our group. And you can see the patterns. It's a little bit hard to read, but like 124 is a little bit worse than the 142 is about here because in 124 we only consider a and at the later stage we also put the full year into account and generally this uh accuracy patterns actually are very similar as what we get in our paper a little bit worse because of the operational uh in the operational case you will face some technical problems in some outliers and also sometimes uh, the real arrows are not as the Gaussian arrows as we also assumed in the paper. So I also want to mention that all those predictions, I, I just introduced one of them, but we have a huge amount of UOP predictions and EM predictions which are available online in the Geodetic Prediction Centers maintained by our group. So if you are interested in those results, so please have a look. Uh, what's next? How can we better apply deep learning to the EOP predictions uh, problem? So how about the other architectures? For example, we know that the state of the art architecture for time series predictions is actually the attention based architecture or let's say transformer. We know that the chat GPT or most of the large language models are transformer based architecture. But here, I personally have an opinion like it might be dangerous or difficult for us because those attention-based models are really data hungry. So if you really want to train the model, usually have a billions of parameters, we also need such a huge amount of uh, trainable, uh, sorry, a huge amount of data. Unfortunately, we just do not have those for, for EOP, uh, although the Earth is rotating there for more than billions of years, but unfortunately, we are only able to monitor it things like 40, 50 years ago. So it might be not so easy. So next direction, and which I personally think is very interesting and promising direction is to impose more geophysical information or constraints into the deep learning models. So because we know that the Earth's rotation, actually we, there are a lot of geophysics process behind it. And uh, we also have a lot of geophysical equations, although some of them may be not so perfect. So maybe we can combine those information together and try to use the deep learning model to improve those geophysical informations. For that part, I really recommend, uh, recommend the studies performed by my colleague Mustafa, who published a lot of good works in this direction and who has a very good expert expertise in terms of geophysically informed neural network and also the, those applications to Earth orientation parameters predictions. I think maybe in the future he will also give another talk in, in this seminar series. Yes. Then we should also consider the input uncertainties and also quantify the uncertainties of the predictions. This is another interesting uh, research direction because there exist some uncertainty quantification approaches using in the deep learning community, but actually the uncertainties that they are always looking into are a little bit different than what we should look into. So for example, in the computer vision communities, they really they're really interested in the uh, model uncertainties. They want to quantify like how good the, uh, their model is. 
but they do not really consider the uncertainties of their input data. Like if you just have uh, images from dog and cat, you also do not have so much uncertainty information. But for us, when we apply to EOP prediction or generally in our geodetic problems, the input uncertainties are very important. How to consider those input information, oh, sorry, those uncertainty information properly? I think it's also a very good question for us and would be uh, we can benefit from from this information to improve the prediction accuracy, I think. So that's all from my side and thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to the discussion.